finish our Joshua series today. Kaya mag, mag-marathon tayo from chapter 3 to chapter 10 para makuha natin yung mga important leadership principles from uh, the story of Joshua. Okay. We have gone through the, the call of Joshua. Then we went to the uh, character, uh, the, the call of, the great, of a great leader. Then we went to the character of a great leader. And then we went through the commissioning of a great leader. So today, we will be looking at the challenges of a great leader. So we're talking about Joshua here. How many have been present since the beginning of this series? Nasimula nyo talaga from the call of a great leader. Okay? So there have been many principles you've learned about leadership. Hopefully, nakatulong po sa inyo yon in your leadership, in your particular spheres of ministry. And today, we're going to come to the last part, which will be the covering chapter 3 up to chapter 10 of Joshua. I, I end my series to chapter 10 because after that, what follows are just list of cities they have the conquer, the you know the distribution of the land. Then later on, chapter 24, and at the end of that, chapter 23 and 24, focus on the renewal of the covenant, where they made a renewal of the covenant. And that's where you find in chapter 24, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, okay, from Joshua. So we are more focused on chapter 1 to 10 because this is where the leadership qualities of Joshua shine the brightest. <clears throat> and so we can draw from his leadership. Joshua is considered the one of the greatest leaders of Israel, second only to Moses, okay? Because of the way God used him to uh, lead the, this uh, wilderness generation into the promised land. And uh, he also, we also witnessed the signs and wonders that took place under his leadership, the opening of the Jordan, the defeat, the falling of the walls of Jericho. Uh, these are the miraculous signs that God did through the ministry of Joshua, okay? So the challenges of a great leader. So remember this, when, as leaders, when we face challenges, we must remember that these challenges has already been, have already been ordained by God, even before you were born, okay? That's why in Psalm 139, said there in verse 16, while we're still in our embryonic state, your eyes saw my unformed body or my embryo in Hebrew. The word golem there, translated unformed body, actually is the word for em embryo. Golem, small circular mass, that's what it means in Hebrew. So when you're still in your embryonic stage, the word of God said, all the days ordained for me were written in your book, even before one of them came to be. Everything that will happen in your life is already written in the book of God. Especially those things that you never expected, anticipated. Many things happen to us that's never part of our plans. Okay? Many things happen to us that we never anticipated. But it can be positive, it could be negative. Okay? And so, sometimes you ask, why? Okay? Pero pag uh, maganda yung nangyari, hindi man tayo nakakaalala. <laughs> si Lord yan, di ba? Pero pag may negative nangyari, naalala si Lord, Lord, why? <laughs> So let's be thankful in whatever circumstance we have, as Paul writes, whether positive or negative, let's be thankful. When we are experiencing a sudden blessing of God that we never anticipated, let's be thankful. Pag damating is some challenge, unexpected, let's be thankful. Because all of these are part of God's plan of preparing us, qualifying us for our destiny. These are all necessary in preparing us, okay? And Joshua was not exempted from those challenges, okay? So... Uh, going back to that verse, so all the days ordained for you were written in this book. Now, there are two ways that scholars interpret that. It could simply means that he has a list of how, many, how long your life will be. So all the days ordained for you were written in this book. If you're, that means he listed how long your life will be. Okay, but in the use of the word, the book of life in the Old Testament, not, not the same as the New Testament, actually, it's not just a list of number of days. It lists, you know, a story. What will happen? Because these have been ordained by God in your life. So there are things that happen to you that are the result of your decisions. Okay? So God will allow us to uh, face consequences. If there are wrong decisions, then God will allow you to reap the consequences in order to correct you. Because if God will spare us from all the consequences of our wrong actions, we will never learn and we will never grow. So whenever you make a wrong remember every decision entails a particular consequence, okay? So, that's why may that decision-making natin kasi lahat siya may consequence, yeah. okay? So, if a good decision, you can be sure God will support you even though there might be negative things that may happen against you, but because you made the right decision, God will support you, okay? But if you make a wrong decision, well, God will definitely love you enough to allow you to reap the consequences so that you learn, okay? 
So, part of ng divine disciplines or training us in character. Okay? So, every challenge that God brings to your life will always be God's size. God's size, not your size. Because kung bibigyan siya ng challenge sa'yo na kayang-kaya mo, wala na glory ang Diyos doon. Ikaw ang glorified. <laughs> and, and whenever God brings challenges to your life, it is intended to bring Him glory. That's why challenges are always God's size. Which means you cannot overcome this challenge without God. You cannot overcome this challenge without depending on God. You cannot overcome this challenge without depending on the wisdom of God na bibigay sa'yo. So, challenges are meant to teach you total dependence on God. They are meant to humble you, to teach you where you are and where God is. Okay? Kasi tayo, madaling yumabang, lalo na mga lalaki, di ba? Weakness ng lalaki, mayabang. Nakakalimot, we often forget who we are <laughs> before a, a holy God, di ba? And so, that's why God will often send us challenges just to humble us. Because God wants us to, to remain useful. The moment you become proud, pipitikin ka na niya. Because in 1 Peter 5, the Lord is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Amen? So who wants to be always used by God? Amen. Sinabi niyo kay Lord yan, you better prepare. <laughs> but because God is committed to keep you useful because that's what you want. So He will have to send your challenges to keep on humbling you. Even the great apostle Paul was not spared. In 2 in Corinthians 12, he was sorn, sent, I was sent, I was given that mis God is the source. I was given a thorn in the flesh. And he defines a thorn in the flesh as a messenger of Satan. Yung tinik sa kanya, hindi sakit, tao yun. A messenger of Satan doon sa Corinth who has been trying to destroy and discredit him as an apostle. You have to read the preceding chapter, chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, tells you the background of chapter 12. Chapter 11 talks about an opponent in Corinth that is really trying to destroy him. And in chapter 12, he alludes to that by saying, God, in order to keep me from being conceited because of the many visions, by the way, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, to keep me from being conceited because of the many dreams and visions he received from God. Eh, naman tayo, pag maraming signs and wonders, yung mayabang tayo. Totoo hindi? Right. Okay, that's why if God uh, doesn't bring too much signs and wonders, maybe it's because he, uh, he, he might see that baka yung ka. Okay? But it's not about you. Amen? If you experience signs and wonders in your life and ministry, give glory to God. That's not about you. God is not giving you a favor. God is making you a display window of His power for others to see. Everything is an expression of divine grace. Okay? So challenges are meant to humble you. And so Paul, sabi niya, I was given a thorn in the flesh, ayan, to keep me from becoming proud. Dati mga sa verse 6, ayan, ito. To keep me from becoming conceited. Amen. So pag sabi sa katabi nyo, mag-ingat tayo, huwag tayo yayabang. Baka padalan tayo ng tinik sa laman. <laughs> Kasi God wants to keep you useful, right? Because that's what you want. And He will, ah, papatulang ka niya. Gusto mong paggamit? Sige, maganda ka lang. <laughs> okay? So the third animal is a messenger of Satan because in chapter 11, he mentions there's a false apostle in Corinth claiming to be apostle of Christ. You know, no wonder he said that Satan can disguise himself and look like an angel of light. No? And also his followers. No? So there was this false apostle in Corinth who is discrediting him. Kasi parang naagaw ni Pablo yung kanyang ano eh. Kanyang reputation. <laughs> Sinataka niya si Pablo, talagang walang katapusan. That's why si Pablo, medyo naapektuhan din. Tao rin naman siya eh. Right? Even though you know how to love your enemy, pag the enemy is too consistent, uh, you know, sometimes you begin to break down also. <laughs> because you're not Jesus Christ yet. <laughs> Ako, I've, I've learned to love my enemies, pero yung enemy na, talagang, ganun, na may misan niya. You know, it gets to your nerves also at times, okay? And this one really got to the nerves of Paul. Talagang naapektuhan talaga siya. Kasi he's trying to, to, kasi ang, the Corinthian church was such a problematic church. And if his, the, the respect for his authority diminishes, wala na, tapos na, hindi niya maayos yung mga problem, wala na magiginig sa kanya. They're very concerned siya dito sa, that's why in Corinthians, First Corinthians, he even defended his apostleship. Also in 2 Corinthians. Kasi kine-question doon sa Corinth yun. Okay? And this was this false apostle, a false uh, apostle of Christ in Corinth who is trying to discredit him. Yeah, yan. He identifies the thorn in the flesh as a 
messenger of Satan. So, you know, many interpret this thorn leaf as a sickness. Ang sickness, kailan, kahit kailan, in the Bible, is never considered a messenger. <laughs> a sickness is not a messenger. Okay? A sickness is a physical problem. A messenger is a person, either an angel or a person. Because both are messengers. So, a messenger kasi, nakiklaim siya the apostle, a messenger of Christ, in chapter 11. You need to go through chapter 11 to understand what Paul is talking about here. Okay? A messenger of Satan to torment me because of his incessant attacks against his reputation. So, nung nakaranas na ganyan, walang katapang sinisiraan ka. Praise God. O, yun. Uh, wag lang tayong manira. <laughs> Kasi mapigat ang ating disiplina sa Diyos pag tayo nanira sa iba. So can you say to the person beside you, di bala na masiraan ka, wag lang ikaw manira. Kasi baka banatan ka ng tatay mo. Do you understand that? The Lord's servant must never quarrel. Important yan. No? Very important yan. Kasi Paul could have, you know, Paul could have, you know, debated, you know, and publicly, you know, hit back at that person. Sabi niya, Paul, sa apostle ka! Sino-sino ka magsalita dyan? Pwede niyang gawin na public kasi authentic, a genuine apostle siya, called by Christ himself. Ito, nakakunyari-kunyari lang. You understand this? He has all the right to publicly rebuke this person. Pero, chose not to. Kasi, alam niya, the Lord is allowing that to humble him. So that he will not be conceited. So God can use, you know, human pests to keep you humble. So long as you don't fight back. Kasi pang nag-fight back ka, mayabang ka na. Pinagtatanggol mo na yung kayabangan mo, naninidurog niya. A humble person will never react against this because he puts his trust in God, knowing that God will be the one to vindicate him. You understand that? Second uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. This is something Paul never did. That's why he teaches Timothy, this is how you respond to your opponents. Okay, ano sabi dyan? Okay, can we read together? And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. So, ano ra, pag servant ka ng Lord, ano dapat reaction mo sa mga umaaway sa'yo? Be kind. Be kind. Okay? Just teach. Don't be resentful. Kasi you are a light. Kung yung di, if the person is hurling darkness at you, you will never defeat him by also hurling darkness. If you want to diffuse the, the darkness, you have to shine your light brighter. By being kind. That's how you control the situation. Because when you react negatively to a per, an opponent, he is now in control of you. You have lost control. Kasi kayang-kaya kanya ibaba sa kanyang level. Kayang-kaya niya ilibas ang kademonyohan mo. <laughs> Kaya ikaw yung talo. You understand that? Okay? That's why Paul writes, it's not be quarrelsome. You know, every pastor, every Christian leader should memorize this. So that when you're about to quarrel with someone, maalala mo, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Okay, Lord. Muntik na. <laughs> okay, pag-away. <laughs> Amen. Okay? So, Christian leaders, including pastors, must be the kindest people on earth even when they are offended. Amen? Because we are the light of the world. We do not add to the darkness. Or we defeat the reason why we exist. We exist to be the light. Okay? Agree? Next verse. So what will be the effect if you're going to be kind to an opponent? Oh, gently. So he's talking about false teachers, actually, who's trying to, you know, kasi bata pa si Timothy, dinadala sa seniority pa. So they were lambasting him. Okay. Uh, I mean, you, you don't understand what you know. Siguro yung sinasabi kay Timothy. Sabi ni Pado, cool ka lang, cool. <laughs> gently instruct. You know the truth. I have mentored you. You know the truth. I have entrusted the gospel. You know the truth. Be gentle. Don't sa mga naliligaw. Amen. Gently instruct them. In the hope. Amen. Bakit I, why do we have to be kind and gentle to an opponent? 
What is the hope? Remember, the best way to overcome your enemy is not to defeat him. Because if you defeat him, and he does not accept defeat, you will always have an enemy. Maybe for life. The best way to overcome an enemy is to win him to your side, to acts of kindness. Because if you win him to your side, you have no more enemy. You can live in peace. But if you defeat your enemy, you may not live in peace, but in pieces in time. Kasi babang gagantihan. Hawag lang ka pa para gantihan ka niyan. So the only way to overcome evil is not to, para patulan mo, show the opposite. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So be good. Siya very unkind, be kind. Okay? Siya unforgiving, forgive. Do the opposite. That's how you take control of the situation. Because if you react negatively, oh, the person is now in control. At kung siya ay madilim, didilim ka na rin. So the light is gone. Understand that, okay? So, why do we have to be in the hope that God will lead them to the knowledge of the truth? By granting them repentance. So you do not bring people to repentance by fighting against them. Kasi they will be forced to defend themselves. So how can they repent if they are very defensive? But if you show kindness, and they realize, hindi kanya, hindi kanya kaya, kasi kahit anong gawin niya, hindi kanya papagalit niya. You realize, you're in control. Hindi siya may control. Because you're in control of your reactions and your emotions. So he will learn to respect you. And he may listen to you in time. You understand that? That's why in Proverbs, a soft answer turns away wrath. Amen? Itinapo na kaapoy, sinabugan mo ng bonfire. <laughs> Nakuha nyo? Itinapo na ka ng isang bowl of fire, sinabugan mo ng bonfire. Ano mangyayari? Di lalong lumaki, baka buong bahay nyo sunog na. Ano kailangan when you, somebody throws you a fire? I-bless mo ng tubig, oh. <laughs> you understand that? Because by doing that, God may grant him repentance not because of your negative reaction, but because of your gentle instruction. Gentle. Amen? Show him you're in control, not the person. Because if you react in anger, he is in control of you now. And talo ka na. Sira na testimony mo. You just damage the Lord's testimony in your life. E sino pa makikinig sa'yo next time? E mainitin pala ulo mo. Sabihin mo, pasto ka pa naman. Okay? You understand that? Leading them to the knowledge of the truth. The only way to lead people to the knowledge of the truth is through gentle instruction. Pag sabi, gentle instruction. Amen? And look at what happens if you win the person to the truth. Next verse. If that happens, then they will come to their senses and escape from the trap. Because false teachers are what? are deceived by demons. False teachers. They will come and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Okay. So, can Satan control people? Yes. And he can only control people by making them believe his lies. So long as Satan can deceive you, he can control you. But if you know the truth, and you expose the lie by holding on to the truth of God, His power over you is broken. And remember this, Satan's control only works through deception. If he cannot deceive you, he cannot control you. And how do you keep yourself from being deceived? The Word of God. You must immerse yourself in the truths of God. So you'll know, pag totoo pumapasok sa isip, hindi totoo yan, demonyo yan. I reject that. Okay? So he cannot deceive you because he cannot control you. And these people have been deceived by false teachings from demons. Kaya now they are under full control. They are now doing the devil's bidding. Do you believe that even pastors can be doing the bidding of the devil? When does that happen? When pastors give themselves over to bitterness, the devil is in control. Amen? 
Kaya tayo mga pastor, hindi tayo dapat nagtitake offense. Kasi pag tayo nagtitake offense, madali tayong kapitan ng tuko. You got that? Ephesians 2, Ephesians 4, verse 27, 28. Pastors and Christian leaders must be unoffended. Kasi offense is always a choice. I can choose to take offense. Away tayo. I can choose to forgive you, understand na pare-pare lang tayo may kahinaan, yan ang kahinaan mo, so I respect that. Okay? Hindi ko yung papatulan. Or you can say na he's still a work in progress, so ba't ko siya tatapusin? Di pa nga tapos si Lord sa kanya, tatapusin ko. Ako nga, di pa tapos eh. <laughs> you got the point? Kaya pag may humility ka, mas madaling maging patient. But kung mayabang ka, ay talagang magiging impatient ka. So can you say to the person beside you, humility brings you patience. Pride makes you impatient all the time. Amen. So kung tayo laging impatient, isa ibig sabihin yun, mayabang tayo. Kasi hindi mo na, you do not see your own defects, your own weaknesses, your own mistakes. You only see the mistakes of others and you get angry. Forgetting you're the same. Pareho lang naman kayo may kainaan. If you're humble enough to recognize who you are and what you are, you won't be able to condemn others kasi ikaw dapat rin i-condemn eh. You'll show compassion instead. As God has showed compassion to you, even though you deserve to be condemned. Grace. We show grace as we have received grace. But you cannot show grace if you're mayabang. You can only show grace when you're humble enough to recognize that you're also a recipient of that grace. Amen? This is also true of married, married, marriage relationships. A wife has to be humble. A husband has to be humble. It works both sides. Right? You cannot just say anything you want to your husband and wife because you are commanded by the Word of God to respect Ephesians 5.33, see to it that the wife respects her husband. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, husbands, you know, treat your wives with respect so that God, your prayers, will not be hindered. Pag mga husbands, uh, hindi dishonor ang wife, sabi ng Lord, hindi ko papakinggan prayer mo because you're not being a good leader to your wife. You understand that? Impatience ruins a lot of things. It also deprives you of the favor and blessings of God when you're very impatient. That's why, magpakumbaba tayo. And God has a way to humble you. He sends you thorns in the flesh. <laughs> Challenges are meant to, you know, bakit, when you keep anger in your heart, you give the devil a foothold. That's why we are not to allow anger to stay long in our heart. Wag palubog yung, wag palubog yung araw sa galit mo. Kasi you're opening the door for demonic invasion. You understand this? So the word foothold there is the Greek word topos, usually translated place, but in this context, it means opportunity, jurisdiction, control. Hold. Okay? So if you allow anger to stay in your heart against somebody, you're inviting the devil to take control of your life. And soon you'll be doing things you're not supposed to do until masira ang testimony mo. You understand this? Okay? So, challenges are meant to Humble us. That's why Paul writes, To keep me from being mayabang, the Lord sent me a thorn in the flesh. To torment me. Sino nag-torment sa inyo ngayon? Meron ba? Praise God for that tormenting person. You know, when God sends you somebody who to torment you, it's simply clear. Masyado kang mayabang, kayo may nababa ka niya. <laughs> you know, Desperate situations call for desperate measures. <laughs> if the Lord says you're mayabang, He will so, so send you a tormentor. Para makita mo, hindi lagi ikaw ang siga. May pa ipapang masiga sa'yo. <laughs> e, pakumbaba ka na para hindi na kailangan magsiga-siga sa'yo. Kasi ang Diyos na mag-protect sa'yo. Kasi makmuga pa, makumbaba ka eh. Amen no ba? So challenges are meant to humble you and to keep you dependent on God, even for your vindication. Don't have to defend yourself because God can vindicate you. You understand that? Okay? Can you say to the person beside you, get rid of all anger. The servant of the Lord must not quarrel. 
Amen. Okay? So, challenges of a great leader. Okay? Let's take a look at this slide again. So, we're, go we're going to jog a little bit from chapter 1 up to chapter uh, 4. And then later on, we'll go to the next chapter, summarizing the main points of leadership. Okay? In chapter 1, 7 to 9, which is one of your favorite verses, our favorite verses as leaders is, can you recite that by memory? Joshua 1, 7 to 9. <laughs> we should memorize this because this is God's formula. God has no formulas. It is God's directions if you want to be successful in your calling. Okay? Is total obedience to God protects you. The moment you disobey God's commands, you are exposing yourself to the enemy. Every act of disobedience exposes you to the devil. That's why for your protection, I encourage you please to memorize those verses because they will be very, very good reminders. Okay? Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right. Ano yung sabihin, turn to the left and right? Lord, baka may shortcut dito eh. Sabi, dito ka dumaan. Lord, dito na lang, may shortcut ito. Do not turn to the left or the right. Temptation will always cause you to turn to the left or the right because you want shortcuts. <laughs> Remember this, temptation is a suggestion to satisfy a legitimate need or desire in your life in an illegitimate way. Kung wala ka feeling of desire or need, you, you are untemptable. Temptation only works when you have a sense of need or desire. You got that? That's why, when did the devil tempt Jesus in his 40 days of fasting? At the end of the 40 days, he became hungry. Then the tempter came. Ah, yun. Satan was not tempting them the whole 40 days. The temptation came at the end of the 40 days when Jesus finally experienced real hunger pangs. Kasi naubos na yung kanyang uh, reserves. <laughs> payatot na siya. 40 days pinaman siya dumating magpapayatot. Nun. Best way to lose weight, <laughs> 40 days fasting. But never get into there without medical guidance kasi you might die. <laughs> Please don't attempt that. Okay? So, 40 days, Satan did not disturb him. But at the end, when he became hungry, the tempter came. When he sensed a need, pasok ang demonyo. He's been waiting for that for 40 days. Nakaramdam ng need eh. Ayan. Meron na tayong business. <laughs> so if you have felt needs or desire, the devil is always on business 24-7 to offer you instant solutions. If Satan is going to register his company with SEC, I know what will the name of his company. Instant Solutions Incorporated. <laughs> because that's how he works. Because you know, God meeting your needs and desires takes a lot of time. Yes. And God tends to delay. If God is answering your need and desires, immediately, wala nang negosyo si demonyo. He will lose his business. Kaya ang Diyos, binibigyan para siyang chance makaroon ng business eh. By allowing you to have a delayed response in your, for your needs and desires. Now, aren't you asking the question, Lord, bakit kailangan i-delay mo kasi yung sagot mo? Kaya hindi mo nyo tuloy. Ang ganda ng business sa buhay ko. Instant Solutions, Inc. That's what, left and right, that means you're finding shortcuts. The Lord, the life, remember, is narrow. Obeying God is walking the narrow path. So, what, when would you turn to the left or the right? What will make you turn to the left and the right? Because you're looking for a shortcut, an instant solution. You got this? So, let me tell you again this. If you have no, no, absolutely no sense of need and desire, you are untemptable. But that only happens when you are six feet below the ground. So long as you're alive, you will always have a sense of need or desire. Siyempre, nakukutong ka, you will need food. <laughs> and the temptation is, eat a lot. 
That's the temptation. Eat more. Stress ka? Eat. Stress ka? Eat more. Ayan. Patay. <laughs> Turning to the right, instant gratification. Okay? That's why fasting is good training in patience and waiting for the right time. Kaya kung tayo impatient, mag-fasting kayo para matuto kayo mag maghintay. Amen? Do you understand that? Okay? So, rattle that because God doesn't want you to take shortcuts. You have to do things His way, not yours. Not the devil's way. Understand that? This is the secret to success in your calling. No shortcuts. No giant leaps. It has to be one step at a time. And that takes a lot of patience. And patience implies humility. No humility, no patience. Amen? So if you, if, Lord, if, Pastor, impatient ako. Isa lang yun, mayabang ka. Alam ko sino ka. <laughs> sino sa inyo galit sa mayayabang? <laughs> Some of them know the, my next response. <laughs> Those who are irritated by pride people are themselves proud. <laughs> because the pride of the person is stepping on yours. <laughs> You're getting angry. But when you're humble, you don't get irritated at proud people. You feel compassion for them, trying hard. <laughs> because you have no concern about, you know, your own reputation. Pity, yeah, pity. Oh. Pero si Christ, compassion talaga sa mga kaaway niya. <laughs> okay? So, pity towards the person because ikaw, you have no drive to prove yourself. He has a drive. Nakakaaway. Pag sabihin, he's not secure. But if you're getting angry, the mayan, nayayabangan ka, gusto mo nang, oh, ayabang ka, tinatapakan niya kasi kayabangan mo, kaya nag-react ka. Hmm. That's also true of marriage, ha? Kaya lagi ang nag-aaway ang mag-asaw kasi pareho yung proud, eh. Sabihin, ang yabang-yabang mo! You know, you will never say that kung ikaw ay humble. Kasi maintindihan mo yung tao, eh. May need siya to feel affirm, important. Kasi ikaw, wala ka nung need na yun, kaya okay lang sa'yo. You understand that? Amen? Nayabangan pa kayo sa asawa niyo? <laughs> <laughs> so, do not let, do not turn to the left or right. obey without compromise. Do not take shortcuts because there are no shortcuts that will bring glory to God. Only His way brings glory to Him. Because the path of God is always low. The devil's path is always quick and fast. Kaya very tempting eh. Kasi may need ka, may desire ka, takal naman ni Lord. Lord, gutom na ako. Ah, sarap. <laughs> Kontra sa iyong health. Sige na lang. Why does God love to delay answers to our legitimate needs and desires? And therefore, the devil has a lot of business capitalizing on that slowness of God's response. Can you tell me why God is so slow? Okay, there's one. That's part of it. Because God is more interested in building character in you than giving you what you want. He's teaching you patience, humility. He's teaching you gentleness to your enemy. Lord, why is it that this person is still here in my life? I've been praying for you to remove this thorn in the flesh. It's tormenting me. Messenger of Satan. No. What did the Lord said? My grace is sufficient for you. That means, I won't take it away. I've given you enough grace to endure that. Because it is when you feel weak, that's where I can perfect my power in you. And I need you, I need to keep you weak. Because if you're not weak, mayabang ka. That's why I send you the thorn of flesh to keep you from being conceited because of the many revelations you have received. That's why I remember this. The greatest pitfall of those in the prophetic ministry is always pride. Always pride. As I always tell people in the prophetic uh, gifting, 
The greatest manifestation of a true prophetic calling is humility. Because that's what makes you a true servant of the Lord. And the mark of a genuine prophet of God is that he has the heart of submission. No submission will lead to the corruption of his character because of his gift that is very powerful. The prophetic exerts so much power because people think you're God. Ne? People will come to you, consult you. Do you have any word for me from the Lord? Parang ginawang crystal ball eh. <laughs> Puntahan ang mga naghahanap ng fortune. And some will even offer you money, di ba? By the way, I, I, I saw a couple, pastor couple, who after talking with them, but they're making money out of the prophetic. Hindi naman sila prophetic, nakukunwari lang. Kasi no, I tested them, oh, prophesy, hindi man totoo. <laughs> prophetic ba ito? <laughs> Tapos, they are, uh, you know, asking for money. <laughs> Couple yan sila. Pero praise God, because I kept inviting them to attend, you know, I did not mention kung saan mga, I had uh, uh, modules and teachings. I noticed nag mellow down na sila. Okay. So, we haven't even scratched here, no? Okay, so you understand why God delays? Because God is more committed to make you like Christ than giving you what you want. To Him, He can give you anything you want. But that doesn't help fulfill His purpose in your life. It only intensifies your self-gratification. But it doesn't fulfill His purpose if He gives it to you immediately. And because God delays His response to your legitimateness and desires, then you'll have to be patient if you want to overcome shortcut temptations. The only reason why you fall into temptation is because you're not patient enough to wait for God's time and God's way. That's how you fall. Because of your impatience. You understand this? Because Satan will not offer you an instant solution if you have no feeling of need or desire. But he knows we all have those felt needs and desires. So he has a lot of business in our lives. And if you're not patient to wait for God's answer, you will fall into temptation to his shortcuts, to the instant solutions of the devil. Do you understand this? Okay, so that's why God was telling Joshua, you want to succeed. Let's go back. Verse 8. Do not turn to the left or to the right. Be careful to do everything written in the law that I gave to my servant Moses. If you do that, you will be prosperous and successful. Amen? You want to finish well in your calling? Let the word of God marinate humility in you. Because without that humility, you won't last long. Because if you're not humble, you'll become impatient and you will fall to all kinds of temptations along the way, instant solutions offered to you by the devil because you don't have the patience to wait for God's way, God's time to meet your need and desire. So haste makes waste. Pastor, I've been praying for 20 years. So what? Moses waited for 40 years. <laughs> In the wilderness. Waiting for his destiny, para siyang natabi. Forty years. You know what he learned in the wilderness? Two things: humility and patience. Taking care of those animals, you know, Bedouin shepherds of Israel call sheep or lambs the dumbest animals on earth, because they easily go astray. Okay, so for you to be an effective shepherd, you have to be patient with the animals. Baka mami lang gawin mo siya ng pagkain sa sobrang impatience mo. Imbes na pangalagaan mo, kainin mo na lang para wala ka ng problema. <laughs> you understand that? Takes a lot of patience to be a shepherd. And he was a prince in Egypt, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, educated in all the wisdom and knowledge of Jesus, according to Stephen in Acts chapter 7. He was a man great in words and deeds, according to Stephen again. He was an eloquent person, a man of great words, and according to him, a man of great deeds, according to Josephus, Jewish historian, writing in the first century AD, mentioned in his history of the Jewish people, Joseph, by the way, was a soldier, 
that was involved in the revolt against Rome that ended in 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem and ended in Masada suicide. He was one of those soldiers. He was a soldier, a Jewish revolutionary soldier who started to record the history of the Jewish nation. So I don't think he was in the battle. I think he was in the logistic side. Okay, that's Josephus. So Josephus wrote that Moses championed Egypt against an invasion of Ethiopians from the south. The Ethiopians mounted a surprise attack against Egypt from the south. And Moses was the one commissioned by the king to lead the army to defend Egypt, and he defeated the Ethiopians. Now, whether we take that as true history or hearsay lang ni Josephus, okay, we don't know. But many historians who study his works seem to say that much of what he's saying has historical data, you know, in, ar in archaeology and in other history books. So if that is true, then that explains what Stephen said when he said, Moses was a man great in words and deeds. He was a champion. Military guy in Egypt during his first 40 years. Okay, so to make a story short, eh, nakapatay siya ng Egyptian, military siya. <laughs> you know, for him to kill an Egyptian with just one blow, he must be very professional. <laughs> Do you understand this? Okay, so anyway, why are we saying this? Okay, he wanted a shortcut. Eh. He wanted to save his people from, from cruel treatment by killing an Egyptian. He was too impatient because he was too proud of his power. That's why God brought him to the wilderness. He heard that the Pharaoh wanted to kill him. Because the Pharaoh knows he's not Egyptian. How dare you kill an Egyptian? You're even just uh, adopted here. How dare you kill an Egyptian? So the king wanted to kill him. He fled into Midian. And they spent the next 40 years of his life from prince to the despised shepherd. In the story of Joseph, we see that Egyptians look down on shepherds. Because shepherds are nomadic people. They are NPAs. No permanent address. Okay? And they are always having tribal wars. Whenever there's a water source, whoever gets to the water source, you know, has power. So those who don't have water sources roam around looking for water source. But nakita may water source, papatayin kayo to get your water source. Because they want to survive. That's why nomadic tribes are always fighting with another tribe because of water resources or food sources because for them to survive. While Egyptians are builders of cities and civilizations, they have learned to channel food from the outside into the city because of their technological achievements. That's why they're proud. They, they look down on shepherds, primitive people. You understand that? And he became the despised shepherd. 40 years. Can you imagine how that affected the sense of identity? From a prince, great in words and deeds, they suddenly you're nobody. What was God teaching Moses? Humility. And what was he teaching him through the taking care of animals for 40 years? Patience. And those two were absolutely necessary qualities and qualifications he will need for the last 40 years of his life when he leads Israel out of Egypt because the people he will be leading will prove themselves more problematic than his sheep and goats. If he's not trained in humility and patience, baka simula pa lang sumuko na siya. That is why God loves to delay the answer to your needs and desires. Because he's more focused on building character in you. And then when the answer comes, para incentive na lang sa'yo, magpatuloy ka. Pero hindi yan ang aking main business. Ang main business ko is to mold your character. If you want to be useful in my hands, I have to keep dealing with your character. Do you understand this? Amen? That's why the Lord said to Joshua, do not turn to the left or the right. No shortcuts, no instant solutions. Just obey God, even when it's hard, even when it's tough, even if it will take a long period, just obey. 40 years, fine. 40 years, fine. Waiting 40 years, fine. Okay. Routine 40 years, fine. But me, that's all here every morning. And every day until the evening. Ba, me. Boring life. Imagine yung tao na sa nice action sa Egypt. Biglang walang action. You know, sa laki, torturous yun. Ah. But he, he tortured himself for 40 years. 
boring life. But it was part of his preparation, humility and patience. Amen? Let me tell, when you tell the person beside, will it take God 40 years to teach you humility and patience? Okay, sabi, hindi. <laughs> Lord, I'll obey. <laughs> no more shortcuts. No more left or right. <laughs> Amen? Okay? Okay, sabi, learn to wait. Patient endurance is what makes you mature according to James chapter 2, verse, chapter 1, verse 4. That patient endurance finishes work in you so that you may be mature, complete, lacking in, in, not lacking in nothing. That's why God brings you any challenge you overcome because you have changed. You don't overcome because God changed the situation. There's no overcoming, that's escape. Overcoming is when you really handle the situation well because you already changed. And so now you can deal with the situation and overcome it because you changed. Remember, you find true happiness in peace, not because your circumstances have changed, not because people around you have changed. You find true happiness in peace because you have changed. Pag nagbago attitude mo, hindi ka na naapektuhan. Nang dating naapektuhan ka. Kasi nabago man ang pananaw mo at attitude mo doon sa situation. Naging more positive ka, kaya hindi ka na nairita. Amen? This God's business is to change you, not your situation. That's the reason why He brought you the situation. That's why He brought the challenge, because He wants to change you. Now, God, remove the situation. Lord, change my circumstances. Exactly against what God wants. You kept, Lord, change the person. Lord, change my situation. And then the more you pray, the more it gets worse. You know why it's getting worse? Because you're not praying the right prayer. Rather say, God, change me so I can overcome this challenge and rise up to become more like Christ. That is the prayer God will honor because that is His purpose when He brought the challenge to you to teach you character. Amen? Now you understand why you cannot have shortcuts? Because you fall right into the trap of the devil when you turn to the left and the right. The devil will be waiting for you on the left and the right. Kaya mag-ingat ka. Keep your eyes forward and just obey God. Amen? Okay? So leadership is about inspiring faith and obedience to others by modeling obedience and faith in God. So God is calling Joshua, Joshua of all the people here, you must never turn to the left or the right. And all the instructions I've given from my servant Moses, meditate on them day and night so you'll be careful to observe everything, everything, not some, everything written in it. Focus. Question is, as leaders, where is our focus? Activities or the Word of God? Activity or worship? When your life is full of activities, with little time for worship and listening to God in His Word, one day you will feel lost. And then your ministry becomes a mess. It becomes a mess because you have lost the center of the ministry, which is Christ Himself. You've ministered for the Master. You have already neglected ministering to the Master. <clears throat> you understand this? Okay? So, you, as a leader, you are called by God to uncompromising obedience because you must inspire obedience in others by your example as a leader. And, you know, you, it, it will inspire faith in others because they can see that you, are, you trust God enough to obey Him. And you'll see that more when they get to Jericho. Okay? You trust God enough to obey Him even if what God is telling you from a human perspective is really crazy or parang unconventional. It's not how we do it, Lord. Just do it. Lord, that's not how we do it. Just do it. Gipag-debate pa sa Diyos eh. Tama? Pahiya ako niyan, Lord. He will not talk to you anymore. <laughs> si Jesus, napakahiya na para sa'yo eh. Hubad-hubad doon sa krus para sa'yo. Tapos tatakot ang mapahiya. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen? In leadership is about inspiring faith and obedience. True modeling it. You're an example. You're the most. People will look up to you. 
you know how to win the following of your people? Imbes na puro ka na lang preach ng mga, you know, pakonsyensya ng mga messages kasi hindi sumusunod yung mga tao. Kaya pakonsyensyahan na lang. How many tend to preach messages that are don't that impute guilt on people because they're not obeying God? If that's the trend of your messages, you really have a problem in your leadership. And the more you preach messages that make them feel guilty because nakikita mo, this is musun sa Diyos, puro na lang guilt, puro na lang guilt ang ginapreach mo. Daritingan tayo, pagod na yan sila sa'yo. Sabi nga, pinapatamaan ako ni Pastor. Take care. Now we're not saying we don't preach against sin. We preach against sin. Pero huwag mo nang gawing pati na puro ng kasalanan. Wala kang nakikita mabuti. Ang dami yung positive teachings ng Word of God. Instead of opposing sin, preach the opposite. Teach about, kung problema yung patience, teach about patience. Kung problema yung mapag-away, teach about learning to be gentle to your enemy. Amen? Okay? So, but the best way to encourage, inspire people to follow you, model it yourself. Kasi when people see you walking your talk, they will respect you and they will follow you. That's the best way to win the following of people. Maraming pastor kasi hatak tulak ministry. Hatak tulak ministry. Kasi ayaw sumunod sa kanya, tutulakan niya, atakin niya. Nakakapagod yung hatak tulak ministry. Di ba nakakapagod yun? Puro ka lang push, push, push. Because they're not following. Because they don't see it. Anything in you that makes them win your res their respect and watch to follow you. Ano ba nagigita sa'yo? Eh, pareho lang kayo sa kanila. Amen. That's why the Lord said to Joshua, you of all the people, you must observe everything. Do not turn to the left or to the right. Because that's how you establish your leadership and because of that, you will be successful. As a leader, because these people will follow you. Mayroon kang mga successful sa leader, leader ka nga, wala mas sumusunod sa'yo. Is that a successful leader? No. You are a successful leader when people really follow you. Because they are inspired to follow you. Because of your model, you walk your talk. Amen? That's why, yan ang principle of leadership. Let your example inspire others. Be a model. Second thing is that God's word begins with one step of faith and obedience. Okay, this is the crossing of the Jordan, chapter three. The Lord said to Joshua in chapter three, verse seven: Today I will exalt you before all Israel, so that they will know that as I've been with Moses, He is. I am also with you. Now, He don't have to prove to the people, "Sinugo ako ni Dios." Tinawag ako ni Lord. I am an apostle. I am this. I am that. Please don't try to promote yourself. Sometimes people come to me, Pastor, I am an apostle of the Lord. I don't know him, so I don't know if this is really an apostle. Diba? Nilamapit sa akin sa isang Bible study. Pastor, I am a prophet of the Lord. I'm sorry, I don't know you. What are you to say? You're a prophet of the Lord. Have you been tested? Is there a confirmation in the body of Christ that you are truly a prophet of the Lord? Why do you claim to be a prophet? You have not even been tested yet. Do you understand this? There are so many people here clamoring to be prophets, clamoring to be apostles. The question is, do they meet the qualifications of the Word of God? Amen? Tsaka huwag kayo dadaan sa mga seminar-seminar, tapos after that, bayad ka ng mga $50, and then instantly you have a doctoral degree. At tawag dyan, diploma mill. Negosyo na ngayon yan eh. You're being given titles without real qualifications for it. Simply because you attended the seminar and then you paid money. Bibili na ngayon ng mga titles eh. Pero sa mata ng Diyos, walang kwenta yan. Amen. And people will know the truth about you in time. Be sure about that. And that they will know you're a fake in time. You understand that? There are no shortcuts. To the purposes of God. No shortcuts. Amen? Okay? So, today I will begin to exalt you. Let the Lord promote you. Don't promote yourself. Amen? If I promote, I say, I am an apostle of the Lord. I can say that, pero I'm not even sure kung totoo yun. 
I have no, I cannot claim anything for myself. I just do what I have to do, teach, because that's the gift God has given. He wants me to use that, so I'm using that gift to bless the people of God. I have to be faithful to my calling to teach. Amen? But I don't claim I am a great, oh, oh I didn't, don't call me teacher, ano ha, mula ngayon. No, no, no. O call me apostle, ano ha? O call me prophet, ano ha? Never, never promote yourself. Because God, let God do it for you. Let God just show the world who you are. But don't try to prove to the Lord who you are. Kasi yayabang ka dyan. Yayabang ka. Today, I, not you, will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel. Diba? Yang gusto na sana yung lahat ng mga sakop mo yung naniniwala na talagang tinawa ka nila kasi parang di sila makonvince. <laughs> Tawag ba yan, pastor na yan? Pastor ba yan? Diba? Sometimes you experience that eh. You know, don't try to prove yourself. Just be faithful in obeying God. Be faithful in a model of obedience to God. Be faithful in carrying out your ministry based on your gifts. Just be faithful. Don't claim any titles. And God will exalt you at the proper time. And the people will recognize that truly you are called of God. Because God himself will show to everybody that you are his servant. Amen? So say to the person beside you, never seek to promote yourself. Baka mapahiya ka. Let others say that about you, but never say anything about yourself. Because they will be the one to recognize if you're a true apostle, are you a true prophet, are you a true teacher, people will be the one to make decisions, not you. And let God be the one to prove you to the world. Don't prove yourself. Amen? I will be the one to exalt you so that they may know. Diba? You should know that I am the Lord is with me. Huh? You should know that I am called by God. Patay. So that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Why? Because as God opened the Red Sea, now God will open the Jordan for Joshua. Okay? So they will see, wow, dry ground in, dry ground in, pareho. Wow. God of Moses is also the God of Joshua. Follow, follow. This is the true leader of the Lord. Because God was the one who promoted him. God was the one who vindicated his calling. Amen? Okay? The next verse. So, ito ang sinabi niya. The, the priest, when you're to go to the edge of the Jordan's waters, go stand in the river. Remember, we went through this already last time, did we? A commissioning na tayo last time, ano? So, here's the interesting thing. Very interesting about this important event. The priests were to go ahead carrying the Ark of the Covenant, right? And you know what happens if the Ark of the Covenant slips and falls? Right? You know what happens? <laughs> okay? And the Ark falls, you know what can happen? <laughs> Remember the story when David was bringing the ark up there? And then nag-slip? Pero dahil nga, para wag ma-slip, may... Eh kaso hindi man siya priest. He's a man of blood. He's not sanctified or... Sanctified to, you know, to carry the sacred things of God. Immediately God killed him. Okay? Now tell the priest to bring the ark of the man, step into the river and stand where? In front of the river? Huh? In the river? You know what the problem is? Okay, let me tell you what the problem is. Okay? The problem is that, this chapter ng 3, no? The problem is that, verse, because of verse 14 to 15, show that please. Here's the problem. Okay, next verse. Can you read this with me now? The Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. You know what that means? You know when a river is flood stage? 
It is overflowing, and therefore nothing is shallow. Okay, and you know when when the Jordan River is a flood stage, it carries the most powerful currents. In fact, when you go to the book of Job, you'll discover that God was boasting about Leviathan, you know. When he's, he can sit on the Jordan with his mouth open, and he will not be moved. In other words, the testing for the strength of a huge animal is the Jordan River. Now, how can the Jordan River be a test for the brute strength of an animal na dumubog dun sa Jordan? Because the Jordan is legendary for its very powerful currents. During that time, ngayon, di na. Nababaw na ngayon ng Jordan River <laughs> si Israel. It is a test of brute strength for anyone can stand its powerful currents in those times. And so, when you are a priest, and you know if the ark falls, you're dead. And you're commanded to stand in the river at flood stage, you know, with the most powerful currents coming out against you, what could happen? Scary. If you were a priest, would you want to be one of those four who carries it? Stand in the river at flood stage. That means, pag lubog na lang, malalim agad yan. Walang mabawa kasi flood stage eh. That means lahat malalim, hanggang dito agad, pakiat. Would you step in the river carrying the ark of God? And you know you're coming against the most powerful currents of which the Jordan River is legendary about. At flood stage. Would you? Stand the current, diba? Is God telling you to step out into the Jordan? God is calling you to make a tough decision in your life to obey Him. And you hesitate because you're afraid you may be carried away by the currents just too big, too, just too tough a decision. Leadership. We're talking about leadership here. If you're a leader, you really have no choice but to obey God. Because you're called by God to be a leader. A leader will suffer more than the non-leaders. A leader will be given more responsibility than non-leaders by God, and God will require more from a leader than from a non-leader. So that's why, please don't want, don't try going out and wanting to be a leader. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. You want to be a pastor? Be sure you're cold. Baka mami, isang piti ka lang demonyo, bagsak ka na. Because that is not your calling. Amen? Okay? So, flood stage. If you were the priest, stepping into the raging waters with the Ark of the Covenant, you really have to master all the strength you can to keep the Ark stable, right? And as you step that flood, it, you, you immediately sink into deep water. <coughs> First step, and then stand in the river. Which part? The middle? By the way, by the time, the journey was very wide. Not today. Very wide. Okay? The width of the journey river can be as much as a quarter of a kilometer. Lawak mo niyan. Parang, mas malawak ang Red Sea. Stand in the river. Ay, kadi man. You know, yan iisip na. Pero listen to this. Ang galing ng Diyos. Ang galing ng Lord. As soon as there Ark, the, the priest who cannot reach the Jordan and their feet touch the water's edge pa lang. And they are not yet in the river. They were just at the edge when their feet were just beginning to feel the rushing water at ankle level. Listen to this. When their feet touch the edge. Next verse. Come on, excited na sila. The water from the house stopped flowing. It biglang bumukas. So what were the priests imagining when God said, stand in the river? They're imagining that they have to go through, down, try to get somewhere, you know, 
in the river eh. Hindi nila alam, they will stand in the river on dry ground. <laughs> God was testing them. Yung kinakatakutan mo, hindi naman pala mangyayari. Kasi pag tap sa ng edge pala, pong binukas na niya agad. So they can really get to, into the river and stand there in the, in the middle. <laughs> Because they stood in the middle of the river. While all Israel crossed. Amen? Sometimes God will tell you to do scary things, and that's great. Because that will learn you to depend on God, and then you discover, hindi naman pala scary. Because God will be the one to intervene. Have you experienced things like that? You're expecting, because you wanted to obey God, it's gonna be tough, it's gonna be tough, and then you just obey God! And then, hindi naman pala ganun kahirap. Because hindi ka pala, hindi ka pa lumulub-lub, ibilukas na yung Jordan River sa'yo. Oh, drama, di ba? <laughs> you know, that's how God tests us. Will you obey? Even if it looks the worst, will you still obey? And then you discover because you made a step of obedience and faith, abay, hindi ba? Hirap. Nalat lang yun, nasa imagination mo lang. Are you getting to know God more? Yung style niya? Sunod ka lang kasi. God can take care of you. Don't worry. Even if it looks very tough, it could be very painful, don't worry. God will be there and He will be the one to alleviate the pain. Because he, you obeyed Him. All of your fears many times are just illusions. Because God knows how to take care of His own. Now you'll never, you'll never forget this. The story. Okay, just step out. Okay? That's why the principle here is that leadership, God's work begins when the step of faith and obedience. You want to see God at work? Don't wait for God because He's waiting for you. You can never see the great works of God by waiting for God. You see the great works of God when you begin to step out in obedience to Him, even when it's tough, and then you will see the great works of God. How many want to see God's great works in your ministry? Amen. Dare to obey God even when it's tough. And see what God will do. It's not about you. Eh? It's always about Him. You understand this? Okay? So, that's just what happened. Let's go back to the outline, please. Thank you, Jay. So the principle we learn here is that God's work begins with the step of faith and obedience. Even if it looks irrational, even if it looks crazy, even if, even if it looks insane, and God said so, just obey. Because His thoughts are not your thoughts, and His ways are not your ways. Don't try to measure the ways and the thoughts of God by your little thoughts and ways. God always works outside the box, never inside your box. Understand that? God is too great to fit your imagination. Even your imagination is too big for that. Okay? Just obey. Say to the person beside you, you are not waiting for God. God is waiting for you. If you want to see the glory of God, if you want to see the power of God, you better make your step of obedience and faith. You understand this? Kaya marami sa atin, ating buhay parang gulong lang ng palad, walang excitement, kasi you're not allowing God to show Himself because you're always, you know, doubtful, always vacillating in your decision, you know. You're missing a lot. Amen. <laughs> Chapter 4. Very interesting. Can you show that? 4.47. See, God told Joshua, after they have crossed over to the other side, tell, take representatives of the 12 tribes and take 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan where the Ark of the Covenant was standing with the priest. Okay? If you read the entire chapter, the priest stood right in the center of the entire Jordan River while everybody was crossing on dry ground, just like in the crossing of the Red Sea. Are you still here? Okay? 
So after they cross over, the last person went in, nandung pa rin mga priests. And then the Lord said, send the men, each from the 12 tribes, and gather 12 stones from the middle of the, and bring it here as a memorial stone. And they brought the memorial stones to a place, okay? And that's the, that's the first settlement after the crossing of the Jordan. The place is called Gilgal, okay? Now, that place was not Gil Gilgal yet before they arrived. It was named, to Gil named Gilgal because of what God said, I have rolled away your reproach. The stones, the stand stones, 12 stones. It's a reminder to you and your generations ahead of you that how I delivered you from your shame in Egypt. And I brought you identity as my nation. I have removed your reproach today. Because now, you are in the land of promise. I completed all my promises to your forefather, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have fulfilled my promise now forever. All reproach is removed from you. You are now in your land. You understand this? Okay? So those stones will be memorial stones. And the reason it's called Gilgal because Gilgal in Hebrew means a circle of stones. And it sounds like the word for reproach, uh, remove, the removal of the reproach, which is galal in Hebrew. Because I have removed or, or removed your reproach, galal your reproach, therefore call it Gilgal. Pero Gilgal literally means circle of stones, referring to the 12 stones, okay? And then while he was saying this, take a look at the scripture. So Joshua called together the 12 men, he had the point of the tribes, one from Israel, next verse. And said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you in the future when your children ask of you, What do these stones mean? Now why does God suddenly shift the focus on the children? Because that's the future. That's the future. Okay? You see, in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Next verse. Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord to show how great their God is. Okay? When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. God loves memorials. That's why memorials are are made in order to let you remember what God has done. That's why the Lord's Supper is a memorial instituted by Jesus Christ, so that you will remember what He has done for you. Why? Memorials are important because they create in your heart the proper motivation for obeying God. Because when you begin, you remember and recall what God has done for you, it elicits love and gratefulness to God. And God wants that that is the motive of your obedience. You're obeying God out of love and out of gratitude. Not because of terrorism. Okay? It's because you love God. And he is, well, He's a great God. He opened the Jordan River for us children. No God has ever done that. And we all cross on dry ground. That's even a more miracle. Dry ground. Do you understand this? And it will win the hearts of the people. Ah, our God is awesome. They would want to obey a God like that. Do you understand this? This is so important. Let me show you that this is not once mentioned that when your children ask of you, then you tell them this. This did not happen once. Can you please go to Exodus chapter 12, verse 26 to 27? And when your children ask you, what do this ceremony mean to you? Next verse. Tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down in worship. Tell them the story. Tell them what I did. Tell your children what I did. Okay? You must ask why. You must ask it because once you understand the reason of God, it will blow your mind. Are you asking why? We're not done yet. Okay? Chapter 13, verse 8, Exodus. Exodus 13, 8. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came for that. Sino kausap ulit? Kung hindi magtatanong, sabihin. If they ask, answer. 
If they don't ask, say. Tell them. Okay? Take a look at verse 14 of the same chapter. In the days to come, when your son asks you, what do this mean? Say to them, with the mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Again, when your son asks, tell him the story. Okay? Deuteronomy 4.9 Tell your sons the story. This them is talking about the things your eyes have seen, or let them do not let them fade, but teach what the things you have seen, what God has done. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Okay? 6 2, Deuteronomy 6 6 20. Deuteronomy 6 20. And then tell them the story. Next verse. Tell them the story. Tell them the story. Tell your children what I have done. It's a command. It's not an option. It's commanded. Tell them what I have done. Chapter 32, verse 7. This is what links the two generations together. The story of what God has done. Ask your father and he will tell you, your elders, and they will explain to you what God has done in the past. Mahalaga ang magtanong ka para malaman mo ang ginawa ng Lord. Joshua 4.6, that's where we are. Psalm 44.1, there are so many of these scriptures where God commands when your son asks, tell the story. Tell your sons the story. Tell your sons the story. Ask your fathers the story. The story is important. I'm going to ask you the question. Why is God so insistent in commanding parents to tell their children what God has done in their generation? To inspire faith in the next generation, to inspire them to worship God, and to inspire them to obey such an awesome God. You understand that? You know what the failure of the Joshua generation was? Deuteronomy, uh, sorry, Judges, chapter 2, verse 10. The tragedy of the Joshua generation was that they failed to obey this command. They failed. And because they failed to tell the story to their children, the next generation did not know the Lord or what He has done for Israel. And because they did not know the Lord, and because they did not know what He has done for us, therefore, there's no sense of awe or worship at all. There's no love for God at all. What happened? Look at the next verse. That was the beginning of the apostasy of Israel that will run through future generations. Unended cycle of apostasy until God had to destroy even Jerusalem and the temple itself in 586 BC through the Babylonian invasion and destruction of Israel. It took only one generation to change the future of entire nation. The compromises of one generation corrupts the next ones. That's why God said, tell your children, the story. That they will honor me. They will worship me. They will be faithful to me because I am a great God and I have done them so much grace. And they will love me for that. If you don't tell them, you already have doomed your future generations to turn against me. Question, parents. Are you telling your children the story of what God has done? Are you telling your children what God has done through the Bible stories, through your experiences with God? Are you telling the children, your children, the stories of God? You know why stories? Because children remember truths from stories more than through any other means. In modern education natin, masyadong abstract. Kaya nakakalimutan after na exam kung ano yung natutuhan. Naalala pag may exam, ma-review eh. After exam, hindi na maalala lahat. 
Masyadong abstract eh. Pero lagyan mo sa story, hindi niya makakalimutan hanggang kamatayan. Story is a very powerful medium for teaching because you leave a lasting impression in the hearts and minds of the children. So let me tell you, are you telling the stories of God to your children? If you don't, I won't be surprised if one day sasakit ang ulo niyo sa mga anak niyo because they do not know the Lord nor what He has done. Enough for them to elicit worship of God. For them to say that God, this God is worth all my loyalty and obedience because He is such a great God and a God who has shown so much love. Kaya marami sa atin dito insecure because you don't know God and what He has done. Your worship of God will only be deter determined by your knowledge of God. Shallow knowledge of God leads to shallow worship. Superficial knowledge of God leads to superficial worship. It just pour emotions, 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 goosebumps, but never real worship. Worship is more than just feeling goosebumps or singing a, a very nice song. That is just an expression, but not worship itself. Because you can sing a worship song without worshiping God. It's just a song. Worship is an attitude of the heart that stands in awe of God. Whether with song or without a song, your heart is just captured by the greatness of your God and you want to bow to Him and pledge loyalty to this awesome God. That is worship. Even without songs, even without instruments, it's about the attitude of your heart towards God. That is true worship. And you will want to obey Him. That is true worship. That's why if your children do not know how to worship God, you will have, to, you will have a lot of headaches when they become teenagers. Because just like that generation, they did not know God or what He has done for That's why they started to do evil. They were influenced by the pagan nations that their parents spared the life that God commanded them to annihilate, but they refused because they want them to have slaves. They compromised. The Joshua generation compromised the commands of God. Very clear. Command, destroy everything that breeds, and they refused. Marunong pa sila sa Diyos. Because God did not want their children to grow up in a society that is impregnated by idolatry. But the parents, the Joshua generation, compromise. And their compromise corrupted the next generation until generations to come because the story of the judges goes through seven cycles of apostasy. Seven cycles and ends with Samson. Seven cycles of apostasy. Did it end there? No. After the time of David, balik na naman ang apostasy. Until God had to destroy his own nation and destroy the very temple he commanded uh, David to build for his son Solomon. God destroyed it. Because his people have become corrupt. And it took only one generation to plant the seeds of a future's destruction. Of a nation's destruction. If you want to change the future of the nation, start with your children. Understand this? Okay. So go on, verse 12. Look at what they did because they do not know the Lord. Now what he has done. Look at verse 12. They forsook the Lord. I won't be surprised if your teenagers, when they grow up, when the children grow up to teenagers, that they will forsake the Lord. I won't be surprised because you have not told them the story. They don't know God. Enough to worship Him and to honor Him and to show obedience to God. Because they don't know God at all. Because you never told them who God is. You never tell them the stories of God. Amen? Remember this, a lasting ministry runs through many generations. A lasting ministry does not end with one generation. It goes through the generations. Amen? So are you reflecting on this? God wants the children to know the story because God seeks obedience. Go back to our outline. God seeks obedience out of a heart that knows and loves Him. Yan ang gusto ng Diyos. Hindi yung, sunod kaya ko hindi, paparusahan ka ng Diyos. Ah, patay. Kaya pag wala niyong takot, ayun, kasalanan. Kasi na-justify na nila eh. Kasi wala man silang love or loyalty to God at all. Mas madaling mapasunod ang mga bata pag may heart of love and loyalty towards God. 
Pero pag wala yun, sasakit ang ulo nyo. Kasi pag wala kayo, the mouse will play. Pero pag ng Diyos na, may ilang love for God, kahit wala kayo, nandyan ng Diyos eh. <laughs> And they have the fear of God in their hearts. Because they know God. You understand that? So, don't train your children to be afraid of you. Kasi pag wala kayo, hello, <laughs> the mouse will play. Kasi sa'yo na lang takot eh. Pero kilala nila ang Lord, and they have an awe of God, kahit wala kayo, susunod yan. Kasi God is always there. Amen? Leadership. Okay, can we show chapter 5 verse 13? After they crossed over to the Jordan and they were settled in Gilgal. Gilgal has been the headquarters ever since. Of course, they recognized that the first enemy is Jericho. Because during those times, there is no other entry point into Canaan except through Jericho. Okay. Because the, the Jordan River going out was puro bundok yan eh, cliff. So there's no way you can cross over into the land of Canaan anywhere else except the Jordan, Jericho. Kasi yun lang yung may opening. And because Jericho is the entry point to the whole land in those times, the city of Jericho is the most fortified city in the entire land of Canaan. The most fortified. The thickest wall. Alam niyo story ng Jericho, di ba? The thickest walls, the highest walls. There is nothing like that in all of the land of Canaan. So let me ask you today, why do you think that Jericho was the toughest, had the toughest engineering and uh, building structure in the entire land? Why was it guaranteed to be the most secure fortress in the entire land of Canaan? The answer is already obvious, right? Why? Because nobody can enter to nobody can enter to conquer the land without first going through Jericho. It's like the strong man. Pag natalo mo siya, eh, kaya mo na iba. Understand that? So Jericho was the strong man in the whole land. That's why it is it is the most fortified city. Okay? Others were also fortified, but not as massive as the city of Jericho. It was constructed to be impregnable cannot be defeated. Amen? Well, you can never be defeated by human armies, but they are no match to the God of Israel. <laughs> Amen? Kahit ano pang ano ng kalaban, wala yan, kahit ano pang in indestructible, <laughs> kaya ng Diyos yan. Amen? Kahit ano pang tigas ng taong yan, parang mahirap na baguhin talaga. Di ba? Kahit ano gawin mo, talagang matigas. Ay sabi niya, walang matigas sa Diyos. And when you're obeying God, God can take care of that. You understand that? Amen? So, what did God say? Verse 13. You know, while he, they were in Gilgal, Jericho had to scout out the land himself. Hindi siya nagpadala ng spy siya mismo as the commander of the entire army of Israel. He went up on a high place just to scan Jericho. And he did not know. I'm, I'm sure when he was looking down at Jericho at a high place, he was thinking, how can we defeat this city? We have no experience like this in the past 40 years. Most of the battles they fought were tribal wars against tribes along the way, but not a fortified city with super fortifications like this one. This is the first time. For you to bring down those walls, if ever you can, you will need catapults, you will need battering rams. You understand what I'm talking about? You watch movies, right? What's a catapult? You put a huge, huge rock, sometimes with gasoline and fire, and and then supposed to bring damage to the walls, right? The problem is that the walls of Jericho are so thick, it can withstand any catapult. It was designed that way. Talagang grabe security ng Jericho. So they did not have catapults because they did not have, Israel did not have that technology in the wilderness. No catapults. How are they going to defeat? Wala rin sila mga battering rams. Basta for battering ram is to try to crush the gate. Open. Okay? But you will need a lot of people to push it and you have to survive all the arrows from the top. Kung buhay ka pa. 
but it's challenging. So if they want to defeat the city, they want to bring down the city, they have to use catapults. Traditional, conventional warfare will demand catapults, battering rams, and scalable ladders. You understand that? But as Jerick, as just a look at it, I don't think catapults will work. The walls are just too thick and too high. Battering rams, if we cannot deal with the archers up there, we'll be dead meat down there. But the walls are too high. Can you imagine when you ni Joshua? What military strategy can we do to defeat this city? There's no way we can possess the promised land until we get over with the city. It stands in the way. Right? And while he was pondering, what military strategy? I'm sure he was asking God, Lord, what do we do here? This is unprecedented for your people. No experience whatsoever in this kind of warfare. And while he was reflecting and pondering, this is what happens. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Okay? Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Obviously, hindi niya alam where this person came from. Are you from Jericho or are you, you know, for us? But obviously, he recognized that this man is not an ordinary human being. You will see it by his actions after. He recognized this was a divine being. Now, why did he ask, are you for us or against us? Listen to this. In ancient times, in those times, the battles of nations are understood by peoples as the battle of their gods. Whenever an army launches us to war against another army, they carry the name of their god. That's why before they go out, they have to make a lot of offerings to their god because their god is supposed to lead them in the battle and defeat their enemy. And the god has to defeat the god of the other nation and find out whose god is more powerful. So, hindi tulad ng modern warfare, it's all humans eh. In ancient warfare, they see it as a battle of their gods. Whose god is more powerful? Okay, but they want to worship a god that is on the mountain because the god on top of the mountain is the most powerful god. Remember, everybody had a collective consciousness that the god, the creating god was on a mountain. The mountain was called Mount Eden. And this, this story has been carried down from many generations after the Tower of Babel, you know, caused them to disperse. They carry the stories of a God on a mountain. That, and on that mountain, God talked with man. Eden was a mountain. Do you know that? That Eden was a mountain? How do you know Eden was a mountain? Because according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 9 and following, out of Eden flowed four mighty rivers. Uh, uh, it flowed a mighty river that divided into four branches. And the four branches watered the whole earth. Now, how can a river have such force to reach the farthest places? It must have come from a very high place. For gravity, to be able to allow that river to reach the farthest places, to say the whole earth was watered. Two of, two of those four rivers were still existing after the universal flood, Euphrates and Tigris. The other two, some claim to be Ganges, <laughs> but Ganges doesn't seem to come from where Euphrates and Tigris come from. So you say the sacred rivers, ba? because they're trying to find the two lost rivers, the rivers of life that come from Eden. So, yeah, yan yung background ng mga looking for the river that imparts eternal life because that river flowed from a garden where the tree of life was. Yeah, that's why there are so many legends and myths about that. Galing po yan sa Bible story. Okay, so to make a long story short, Eden was a mountain. That's why in ancient times, people built ziggurats. You know what ziggurats? Step pyramids. And the priest has to ascend. In order to offer him, he has to ascend that to the top. And that's where they believe that God communes with the priest. Where did they get that idea? You tell me. The garden at Eden, where God fellowship with a man, which is near the top of, the gar of Eden, the mountain of Eden. And this memory... Of the God on the mountain, the God who created man, the God who created us is the God that sits on the mountain and who communes with man at the top of the mountain in a garden. That's why most of the decorations of most ancient temples resemble that of trees, you know, gardens, yeah, like an orchard. 
and the steppe pyramid symbolizes a mountain. So all of these ancient civilizations are patterning, but are have patterned their worship places on Mount Eden, the original mountain of God. And they believe that the God of the mountain is the most powerful God. That's why in ancient times, they always build altars on the high places. Always high places. Remember that the high places in the book of Kings? Because that's more powerful. Because they have to have a powerful God to defeat their enemies. Okay? Now, with that kind of historical and cultural background, I think you will understand what happens here. Obviously, uh, Joshua perceived this was a divine being. And he's saying, are you God of Jericho? Or are you the, the defender of Jericho as their God? Or are you, are you for us? Okay? Because the person has not introduced himself. But he had a drawn sword, which means that he is ready for battle. So he's going to fight against Israel? Is he the God of the people of Jericho to fight against them? Or God sent them to fight for Israel? So he's asking the question, are you for us? Are you with the Jerichos? Are you the God of the people of Jericho to fight against us? Or are you for us? Okay? Now you see the historical background. Let's next look at the next verse. Neither neither for you or against you. Can we say neither? neither? Very important answer. But as commander of the army of Yahweh, I have now come. Who is this angel talking to? Joshua, the commander of the army of Israel. Two commanders are talking. I am the commander of the Lord's army. Wow. <laughs> neither. Now, why did he say neither? I, there, wasn't he supposed to bring down the walls of Jericho later on? <laughs> why did he say neither? Because it depends on your obedience. If you obey, I'm for you. If you disobey, I'm against you. Neither. But I have come as the commander of the Lord's army. And if you obey, I will fight for you. If you don't, you're on your own. Now, this is a very important principle for leadership. The success of your leadership really is determined by your loyalty and obedience to God and to His ways, not your ways. God can come against you. Even if you are His child, He will discipline you. But He can also be for you. So if you are God, Lord, are you for me or against me? Well, of course, in terms of salvation, God is entirely for you. But the comes of overcoming your problems, that depends on your obedience. <laughs> because if they obey me, the problem will become worse. You understand that? Neither. It depends on your obedience. You know why he said that? Because the instruction, the military strategy that this angel is about to reveal to Joshua is completely insane. Humanly speaking, completely unconventional, non-traditional, no military general will even consider that strategy. As I said, neither. Depends. We're going to follow the strategy I'm going to tell you. And what was the strategy, okay? But as the Lord, now Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence because he recognized this was a divine being. Okay? And look at how he looks like Moses at the beginning of his destiny. The burning bush. And he heard the same words in the next verse. Remove your sandals for the place you're standing is holy ground. Looks like Moses now, right? This was now the inauguration of his final destiny. The meeting with God coming in human form to speak to him and give him instructions. Just as God came in human form in the burning bush and spoke instructions to Moses. And that officially started his God-given destiny. It is an encounter with God that often begins, brings us into the path to our destinies. That encounter with God is very important. 
Because that is where you receive the full conviction of your calling. That is where you receive the full conviction of God's mission that has been placed on you. That encounter with God is critical. That's why whenever I ask, you know, in terms of uh, assessing candidates for ordination, one of the things I ask is, have you had an encounter with God that gave you the conviction that this is really your calling? How do you know you are truly called of God? Can you tell me? What is your basis for believing you are truly called to do this kind of ministry? And this one began, I know I, I cannot believe na called siya. It has to be conviction that is in your heart because you know it came from the Lord. Are you still here? And God, you may have along the path, you might have been trying to guess your calling, and maybe you are in your calling, but it will take an encounter with God to give you the deepest conviction. Because that conviction is important for you to endure in your calling. Because you know that you know this is my mission. And nothing can change that. You must have that full conviction. Whether you're called to be an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, evangelist, whatever your calling is, be sure you have an encounter with God that made you convinced this is my calling. This is not man-made. This is supernatural. I had an encounter with God. This was the beginning of his destiny. This encounter with God. All the great movements of God in history, in the work of God's kingdom throughout history, begins with an encounter with the God of heaven. Look at the Old Testament, the great men. He always began with an encounter with God, even Nehemiah. All of this, they have been encounter in their own private times with God. Conviction was sold into their souls. A conviction that will change their lives forever. Because they know God's mission for them. Do you have that conviction in your heart? Or baka ikaw lang nagtawag ng sarili mo? You understand that? Are you really called of God? Okay, and Joseph, let's go back to the preceding verse. He said, Joseph was asking, how do we defeat this, this city? So the angel, this angel said, what message, uh, Joshua asked, what message does my Lord have for his servant? He recognized that this angel represents God himself. It's a theophany. God appearing in human form. Okay? And look, when this angel speaks, he speaks as God himself. Okay? Let's go now to the next chapter, verse 1. What is the message? He's saying, Commander of the Lord's army, what is your message? I'm ready to carry out your commands. I'm command of Israel now. Okay? So one commander to another. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. Takot na takot sila sa Israel, kaya lahat sarado di kandado. They imposed on themselves a self-imposed siege. <laughs> no one went in and no one came out. Okay, next verse. Then the Lord said, Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Who is talking? I thought he was talking to an angel. Remember, they're still talking. He said, what is the message that you would like to give my Lord? And he speaks, this is my message. See, I've delivered Jericho into your hands. And look, king and fighting men. Next verse. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. And first six days, you just march around and then go back to your barracks. And then on the seventh day, next verse. But on the se seventh priest carry the trumpet horn. They will blow their trumpets as you go around in front of the ark. But on the seventh day, march around the city seven times. You know, you next seven day. Okay. Seven times seven. With the priest blowing the trumpets. What kind of military strategy is that? Next verse. And when you hear them shout, a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. This is the, most, the weirdest warfare ever. It's a warfare without using any arms. I mean, keep your sword inside, arrows. No need to use your weapons. Just shout. <laughs> Unto Yahweh. 
then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everything straight in. That is impossible, humanly speaking. Without battering rams and catapults, that is impossible. And even some claim, oh, it's because of the, the vibrations created by the shout of many. I don't think so. The walls of Jericho came down not because of the science of acoustics, but because of the action of the angel of the Lord, the commander of the Lord's army, fighting for them. It was the angels who brought down the walls. And why do they have to shout? Why do they have to shout? Because in every warfare, remember, I want to know, but you know the cultural background, in every warfare, when they start to charge against the enemy, armies will always shout to their gods, saying, Ito na! Ah! They're calling upon their god now to lead them and fight their battle. That's why in the war against the Philistines, remember the time of Samuel, Israel shouted, Ah! That like, earthquake, eh? Sobrang lakas. Ayan mga Philistines, <laughs> Sigaw pa lang yun, natakot na. Pero yung sigaw na yun, hindi mo bumagsak yung mga pader nila. Okay, parang lang yun naglinig. Kasi habang nag-shout sila, nagkaganyan sila. Ah! You know? eh, Mag-earthquake talaga. You remember the story, Samuel? Okay. <laughs> That's how they call on God, lead us into the battle. Ah! You know? Hanggang ngayon, ganyan yung study, mga tribes. Dano yung mga sa Australia? Yung, ano yun? Haka. The Haka tribes. <laughs> okay. Pero they just, they just offered sacrifice to their God first before they went into battle. Anyway, it's a call on their God to lead them in their battle. That's the meaning, that's the significance of the shout because armies in ancient times do that when they start the battle. They really shout a loud shout. So the, the people just understood this was the start of the battle. Shout! That means battle is starting, but they're not going to fight. Angels will do the job. This is a supernatural fight. Now let me ask you a question. If you were a Joshua, and you have some training in the military, and you receive this kind of military strategy, would you even consider it? Do you know marching around the city is very risky because you're... <laughs> and imagine the people of Jericho just, what are they doing? You know? But They're not fighting, so they're not releasing their arrow because they're not fighting. They're just marching, marching. General, what kind of military strategy is that? We don't understand. We don't know what to do. They're so confused, they don't know what to do. Because they've never encountered any strategy like that. They go, march on, march on. <laughs> it is partly intended to confuse the people of Jericho because they have never seen anything like this before. Keep them confused. Do you understand this? Are you learning something? Too? <laughs> Why the Lord commanded it? Unconventional. So what did we learn? Let's go back to the outline. And it worked. Because you know from the story that it also just came tumbling down. And they went straight in and defeated the city. Okay? Unconditional obedience, which means even though it drives you crazy, even though you may think it is insane or it's completely unconventional, it's really mm, uh, crazy. Just obey. Just obey. Are you still there? Okay. So, God will often lead you to do things unconventional. You have to be open to see new ways of doing the work of God that will prove to be more effective in solving problems than the old ways. God is a God of new things. God is never static. He's very dynamic in His ways. His ways can change. But you will never be able to get into the move of God. How many wants to be in the flow of God's moves? If you want to flow with God in your life, in your ministry, in your organization, if you want to move with God, don't try to limit yourself with conventional methods. Because that will keep you resistant to the new things God may be telling you to do. 
So when there is something new that's coming to you, do not focus first on the difficulties. Because anything new will always cause its own difficulties. Focus first on the possibilities. And after you consider the possibilities, then try to weigh the difficulties. If the possibilities outweigh the difficulties, it's worth trying out. This may be God's work. A new way of advancing His kingdom. You understand this? But if the difficulties far outweigh the possibilities, you may need to wait. You understand this? And wait for greater conviction from God. Be open to the new possibilities. If Joshua was a close man, close minded general, he would never have done that. That doesn't, that doesn't work. In my experience, that doesn't work. It cannot work. How can shouting you know, defeat our enemy? The shouting without fighting with arms? Are you it? Has God been speaking to you about a new way that He's teaching? And you're afraid because it's not conventional. Have you weighed the possibilities first? The reason why many of us cannot flow with God when God moves in new ways is because we're more focused on the difficulties because everything that God does will always cause difficulties for us. Because this is God's way. God's way is never always in line with man's ways. My ways are not your ways. But if you don't open yourself to the possibilities of what God is showing you, and fear of the difficulties keeps you from following God, you have lost the flow of God in your life. God is about to do something new in your life, but you because of fear. Because all you wanted to see were the difficulties. Because all you, to see. you understand this? Joshua was willing to try something insane. Because God said so. You understand this? Okay? And he this idea came out of this conversation with the theophany, God appearing in human form. Out of that intimate experience of God. Listen to this. That's where true leadership was. They defeated Jericho because that intimate relationship we had with God allowed them to receive instructions from God. And because of his faith in God and his, and his habit of obeying God no matter what, that obedience led to the final destruction of Jericho. It was a new way of God. And he was able to flow with the new move of God because he was open to the possibilities. He did not allow convention or tradition to limit God's work in his life. Some more many of us are so bound by our traditions, we cannot move with God anymore. And we get stuck in that routine cycle because we just want to stay traditional. Every major move of God, parachurch ministries, started at conventional ways. The most powerful movements of God in history started unconventional. And these people were open always to the possibilities. That's why one of the most important qualities of a great leader is that a great leader is always open to new things. And always be open to new possibilities. Great leaders are always possibility thinkers, not negativity thinkers. Ezra Renewal Ministry started through possibility thinking. Every great movement in the world started through people who had the vision to believe the impossible. To people who focus more on possibilities rather than difficulties. And as a leader, if you're always looking at difficulties, you'll never prosper far enough where you are because you'll never be able to flow with God. If you want to flow with God and God's moves in your life, you better open your mind to possibilities more than difficulties. Because once you begin to put your path to fulfill, to move towards a divine possibility revealed to you, listen to this, the difficulties will find their solutions along the way. Are you still here? You begin to adjust to the difficulties along the way because now moving with God. Focus on the possibilities. Do you understand this? Some of you here are creative people. Hindi kayo mahirapan sa possibility thinking. A number of you are structured people. Medyo mag-struggle kayo sa mga new possibilities. 
dahil hindi pamilyar. Structured people are people who don't want to change the status quo because they're more secure with what is familiar. Structured people are passionate for order. And order means keep things as they are. Kaya nag-struggle lagi dyan sa moving with God are these structured people. They struggle with that. Because it's not something familiar. It's not conventional. It doesn't give them a sense of order. It creates a sense of, you know, disequilibrium or disorder. Kasi parang, you know, hindi ako familiar dyan. Kaya yun sila, ang number one ng mga kontrabida ng mga visionary people ay yung mga structured people. Number one kontrabida yan ng mga visionaries. Ay mga visionary. Kaya marami na rin kumontra sa akin. Pero praise God, sumunod ng Lord, kaya na tayong Esra ngayon. Esra is now expanding internationally, globally. Because I started with possibilities. Because I discovered, as you follow God's possibilities, the difficulties resolve themselves along the way. Now, if I started looking at the difficulties, I will never move into the possibility. And I miss God's, I just miss God's move in my life. You understand that? So here's my tip to you. Do not focus first on the, on the difficulties. Everything will always have its difficulty. Everything. If you focus on that, you already checkmated yourself. You're done. Okay. So, unfamiliar is not impossible. Do not confuse unfamiliar. Do not dis di confuse in difficult with impossible. Can we say this together? It may be difficult, but it's possible. Kanya na yung frame mo. Possibility thinker. Don't focus on the difficulties mina. Sa kanya lang yon. Unay mo yung possibilities. Then look at the difficulties and see how you can adjust to the possibility. Okay? Can we read this together? Leadership is empowered by the conviction that for every need and challenge God places before us, God has already prepared the answer, and the answer may come in unconventional ways. That is the experience of Joshua. The opening of the Jordan River, that's unconventional. The bringing down of the thickest and most fortified city in the land is completely unconventional, supernatural. And the defeat of their enemies, massive, outnumbered, but they defeated them all, is unconventional. Do you understand this? Okay? So, I thought I can end it today. So, next month, we'll finish off with a summary of the most powerful leadership lessons that Joshua learned as a leader. That he learned in Jericho, he learned in Ai, and he learned in Gibeon, just chapter 9. And then when he gets to chapter 10, all of those lessons he applied, and he defeated all the tribes after applying all three lessons. We're going to learn these lessons in April. Amen? Okay. Lahat po tayo, remember, utusan lang. Amen? Pagkasabi sa katabi mo, utusan lang tayo. Sunod lang. It's not about you. <laughs> it's about the Lord and what He wants to do. Amen? Okay? Alam mo na, bless ako si isang uh, introduce sa akin na medyo mayaman ang mukhang dyan. Sabi, anong trabaho mo? Sabi sa akin, Pastor, driver lang ako. Driver ka lang? Mukhang mayaman, driver lang. Pero, hindi, Pastor, driver lang ako. I mean, totoo yan, Pastor, driver lang ako. Ito rin alaman ko, driver pala ng international airplane. <laughs> Pero napakahambol eh. Kasi alam niya, driver lang naman, driver lang naman talaga siya. Pag siya yung pilot, parang may... Diba? Yung function lang, ginapokus niya. Function lang. Driver lang naman ako. Na tayo, tayo naman, na tayo ay utusan lang. Amen? Because that is not about, it's about the Lord. And our duty is just to obey. Hear and obey. Okay?